everyone. So it is nice to have Dr. Imran Chakraborty here. Maybe you can see some of the courses that Dr. Shyam stands for. And he currently is having some good papers from my students, and he will be talking on the study of the with memory effects, radiating geometries, and more books. So you know it is. Yeah, so let me begin by So, I will be talking on a topic in gravitational physics which is distant. Separation is 
in this coordinate system that I am writing this exact labels called this Baldwin J P Dozen or in short form B J R suffer from coordinate similarities. Why it is there? I am not going to discuss here, but it is written in our paper. We can go through them. So we are going to construct another coordinate system by coordinate transform. So we employ these coordinate transformations, and we are left with a different kind of coordinate system, which is called the Brinkman, which is called the Brinkman coordinate given way back in 1923 by Hans Brink. So this is the metric line element looks like now in this coordinate system. And we'll employ vacuum solutions of Einstein field equations. And if you note that this u, u coordinate, if you construct u equal to constant hypersurfaces, they are planar and they correspond to wave. So in this metric, as you can see, what is important is that if you set h to 0, this is a mean process. We set h to 0. Only this h satisfies the wave equation. Box h is 0. So if you plug in box h is 0, you will get an equation like this. It is the Laplacian of h. So the general solution of h looks like this. That means this a plus and a cross are the two polarizations of the wave. So now, why this is called plane? The reasoning behind this is if you construct the demand tensors, you find that the demand tensor only depends on this u, u coordinate. And since if you construct any wave front that is new constant hypersurface, this remark tensor is constant on every wave front and hence the new plane with u. And du, this coordinate u acts as an affine parameter for this metric line element, which is a piece of information helpful when we will discuss future exercises. Okay, so what Zag and his collaborators did, they chose a Gaussian first group for this, this, this function, this polarization functions. So basically these are not fixed from the field equations and you can play around with them as you choose. So they chose a Gaussian burst. What is the burst? Initially it is zero, finally it is zero, only in some middle region there is a presence of the pulse. That is why it is called a burst. A transient of gravitational wave. They solved the geodesic equations numerically and they arrived at displacement and velocity mediated. So what we have done in our work is to choose a square pulse which is given like this. You see the figure uh, how this pulse profile looks graphically and this theta are the heaviside theta function. So we studied displacement and velocity memory effects and I will it for this pulse profile. So what uh, oh, yeah I will discuss them in the next this u is simply the light cone coordinate. This small u is simply the light cone. U is a null coordinate. Null coordinate, right? So and it minus infinity to plus infinity. Yes, yes. So this is the pulse profile that we are considering. Initially it is flat, finally it is flat. Only in some middle region there is a pulse. And the pulse profile amplitude is constant in this region. Okay, this is not a Typical scenario, but we are trying to model the memory effect analytically. That's why we are considering this sort of pulse profiles. So this kind of pulse profiles are called sandwich wave space times. Why? Because before and after you have Minkowski, and the wave region here is sandwiched. That's like a sandwich between two Minkowski regions. And why we consider such discontinuous pulse profiles? Why can it happen? Because you know, for a metric, it has to be C two. But we can construct because the demand tensor, as we find out, is only dependent on A plus and A plus, not on its derivatives. So, no cases of delta functions are added. That is why we can construct such sandwich wave. Okay. So, now what is the basic methodology to arrive at the memory effects? So, first you choose a pulse profile, which is this H. Then you solve the geodesic equations for the metric given over here. You start with initial parallel geodesics, which is the total separation due to the passage of the pulse. And this change in separation will be termed as displacement memory. And when you differentiate the solutions, you will get the velocity. So once you get the displacement memory, velocity memory gets in this way. Okay. So these are the geodesic <coughs> equations along x, y, v, and u is the affine parameter, so y over dot u. So if you solve a bit analytically, you can find that this v is dependent on x and y. 
So once you get analytical solution of this x and y, you can get a solution of this. And this k is a constant which is 0 for non zero and 1 for either. Okay, so what happens in plus polarization? So you only consider plus polarization. No plus polarization. And now this is the pulse profile that I've given. So you start by assuming that x and y are and its derivatives are continuous at the boundaries of the pulse. That is equal to minus n and equal to plus. So if you assume this, you get analytic solutions of x and y. Okay. And you will note that the separation along two geodesics along the x direction vanishes for a finite value of x. That is the geodesics part along the x direction. Okay. So this is for x and this is for y. Note that you obtain analytical solutions. And now the plots which discuss the distance and velocity. So you see initially the distance or the separation is constant. But after the passage of the pulse, you find there is a change in separation, both along x, this is the x direction, and this is the y direction. So there is also note that there is a meeting of geodesics along x. This resembles a formation of caustics. Caustics, I mean, two space and trajectories are meeting at a particular point. Note that it does not signify formation of space time singularity. So this is what is displacement memory. And if you now differentiate the solutions, you will get a velocity memory, which I have not discussed. But as you can understand, you will get a velocity memory because this separation is changing. So there will be a velocity. OK, so what happens for a ring of particles? So previously, we examined for two initial co-moving geodesics. I will examine for a ring of particles. Remember the first picture that I saw, where I showed this circle going to an index, and here we will see whether such a thing happens or not. So note that in region 1, x and y are constant, which can be, in a fashion can be written like this, x square plus y square equals r square. So the initial locus is a circle, initial configuration of the locus is a circle, right? So this is a circle, equation for a circle. But now in region 3, what happens? That is when the wave has passed by. So x and y solutions are like this. And the final loci now is a loop. And you can check that this R1 and R2 are not equal. And what, how, what is R1 and R2? This R1 and R2 are dependent on xi and nu. And this xi and nu are in turn dependent on the width and amplitude. So A is the width and A0 is the amplitude. Let me for clarity for the diagram. So this is the pulse, this is the width, which is 2a, and this is the amplitude, which is a1. Okay. So in turn, this r1 and r2 are dependent on the geometry of the pulse, which is this, the width and the height. And this there, there is a permanent distortion due to the passage of the pulse, which is the primary effect. And this, as I told, with this nature of the ellipse is determined by the geometry of the pulse. So what will be the final configuration? Is determined solely by the gravitational wave pulse, its property. Okay. So this is the picture. Initially a circle, finding the ellipse, as I showed earlier. Now we talked about focusing earlier. So what happens in case of focusing? So in case of focusing, either this R1 or this R2 will go to zero. So if you set this R1 and R2 to zero, you get two transcendental equations. Now they can be solved analytically, as you know. They need to be solved graphically. So here you see two graphical solutions, and you find that R1 equal to 0 is only for this. R2 equal to 0 doesn't coincide. So this solution never exists. So this is consistent with our previous analysis on geodesics. Why we say so? Because you see, this R1 vanishes. That means along x direction, this is the x direction, this R1 goes to 0. As I showed earlier, that along x direction is too bad. So that is why this is consistent with our analysis of the two geodesics. So corresponding to this deformation, as you can know, one can find out kinematic variables. What are these kinematic variables? The expansion, rotation. You can find out, but we will discuss it later on. <coughs> this term, what are the kinematic variables? So this is the part that ends over here. What happens for the two moving geodesics? What happens for the ring of particles? So what about coordinate dependence? So 
our entire analysis depends on this link one gate. <coughs> so one might think that it differs from astrophysical settings because you'll observe a memory effect which is being invariant. But you note that the detectors of LIGO and LISA follow time-like geodesic paths. So ultimately, the equation for the detector will involve a geodesic deviation. And we have ultimately solved the geodesic deviation equation by solving the geodesic equation. So geodesic deviation equation that is detectors of LIGO and LISA will follow will be similar to the geodesic equations that in Brickman gauge the detector coordinates are followed. The final change in separation is similar to the ones described in our geodesic and deviation analysis. So this ends the first part of the square pulse part of our talk. So all the solutions here are analytically obtained and they depend on the pulse profile choice that like is. And the geometry of the pulse is responsible for focusing, that which leads to the permanent distortion that I showed here. The geodesic and deviation analysis are identical. A similar analytical exercise can be done for cross polarization or other types of linear polarizations like K plus going to 12 and K plus. So now I will study what happens in terms of geodesic congruence. So now the Lagrangian, geodesic Lagrangian, looks like this. And you note that u dot equal to 1 plus u dot affine parameters. Now note that this v dot being a total derivative. It does not affect the equation of motion. The system reduces to a two dimensional mm -hmm. mechanical system. So you can see here this x dot square plus y dot square are the two kinetic terms, and this is the potential term, and this v dot doesn't affect. So remember our classical mechanics course. So you have a geodesic Lagrangian which describes a potential and a kinetic term. So why does this kinetic term, uh, this potential term, come from? comes from the gravitational wave because we have this a plus. So now this u here acts sort of a type in classical mechanics. And the geodesic equations are nothing but the Euler Lagrange equations. So we again get this similar oscillator equations. So we started with time like geodesics in four dimensions, but you need to solve classical two dimensional system. So the evolution of congruence is we need to find out for studying this what happens the evolution of congruences. What you need to find, what you need to find is the evolution of variant of velocity that you feel, which is this metric, this VI. Gradient of velocity vector field. The vector field is VI and the gradient is this delta. So in two dimensions, this VIJ can be decomposed in this fashion. But this theta, the expansion, sigma's of the shear and omega is the <coughs> rotation. So this is anti-symmetric, this is symmetric traceless, and this is the trace form. So you need to solve this matrix, the components of this matrix, to find out the behavior, what happens for this, this kind of kinematic variables. So this is the evolution equations of theta and sigma and omega. So you need to solve this dynamical system from the kinematic. So why these are kinematic variables? They import what happens to the kinematics of the planet, right? Given a gravitational wave field. And note, why is the gravitational wave part coming? So it is coming in this acceleration term. <coughs> a plus x and a plus y. How, how am I writing this? This is because of the geodesic equations. So this is a sort of acceleration. So what happens is that in two dimensions, maybe you can understand it like this, that in two dimensions, the gravitational waves are giving an acceleration to the part, right? And that is what is coming over here. Okay. So now we we'll try to understand what is this beam memory by looking at the change in the value of this kinematic variables. Right? So now you find that fx and fy, the acceleration is only present in between this region, minus x plus. That is where the gravitational wave pulses. Before and after, it is zero. The acceleration is present only in the region of the pulse. Okay. So you start, you give some initial conditions. What are the initial conditions you give? You give that all the kinematic variables are set to zero. 
So what happens is that there is no variation in the process of that. So what you find that theta again diverges to minus infinity. First of all, you find non-trivial solution. And you find that theta diverges to minus infinity for the same value of theta, right? That you obtain when the two geodesics one along x. So this is the theta and this is the sigma so plus. Is t minus z or something. Yeah. That uh, light will work. So why theta is diverging? Because two geodesics are meeting at a particular point. So this is what we call as shear induced focus. So the change in the final value of theta and sigma plus gives you the event. Right. So here what happens is that there is an increase in shear with focusing, which we call as benign force field. Benign means this does not resemble space time in the right place. And the focusing value of U, as I told earlier, depends on the width and the height of the pulse. And the differentiable nature of pulse is revealed in the plots of shear. This is because if you look at the plot of shear, you find that this is continuous but not differentiated. This is because of the nature of the pulse. Pressure. Okay, so this ends the exact plane weight part. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to discuss that. After that, I'll move on to food. So, uh, in this exact plane wave uh, space, uh, plane wave, uh, gravitational wave, I want to understand what is the background with which you are studying. So this is backward. So backward. So it's like theta mu nu plus some. No, hmm. that's what I earlier showed, right? So anyway, in gravitational wave, it also have a vacuum solution which resembles the gravitational wave. Vacuum solution can also resemble the gravitational wave. I'm not talking about Minkowski. Minkowski is a vacuum solution. In Schwarzschild is also a vacuum solution. You can have a curved geometry that takes to vacuum solution. That is always possible in design, right? So here I am considering a geometry that I have Yeah. So this is the geometry. So this is this satisfies that one. Back of my Can you go slides further? Yes, yes. So yeah. H is your solution of wavelength. H, H, capital H, yes, is the solution of your wave. So, H yes. is a general solution like this if you plug in the vacuum Einstein field. So, this is the vacuum Einstein field equation, you get H like this. Because simple understanding of the gravitational waves for me is simply theta mu plus some H mu nu, yeah. and the, the, uh, the wave uh, equation followed by H mu nu is the gravitational wave in Minkowski background, right? That's the simple answer. Yes. You have can have box H equal to zero, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So this is what is happening. Box H is zero. That's why he's asking. But this is your uh, is your background is a space There is no background time? here. So total space time is like that. No, so that is why we linearize wave to what happens. So gravitation wave perturbation and perturbation in the background of this problem. Yes. So this is not a scenario like that. That is what I am trying to say. You have a space time that has gravity. And when you talk about distortion, it's with respect to your. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting it. But when you are decomposing, this A can be decomposed. That's what I'm saying. That is why it is called nonlinear. So when you have nonlinear, you can't have linear superposition. Theta plus H. That is why this is a nonlinear solution. So suppose you have two black holes. Does it mean that you can add two certain things? Like that. So this is what. It's counterintuitive, but it is like that only. So you have a gravitational wave, but you can decompose it into a Minkowski and a part. But for me, it's just some uh, non-stationary solutions. Yeah, yeah, but it satisfies a gravitational wave. I mean, a wave. Okay, so now we move on to full wave. So here a sort of a background and wave comes about, you can see through it. So here you see, so initially in our case, this H was giving you the gravitational wave part. And now you see in this metric, what is the change in food wave? So you have a conformal factor sitting over here. So P gives you a sort of a background curvature. So why I say this background curvature? This is because when you write down the Riemann tensor or the Ricci tensor, then one part comes from this P and one part comes from this H. And since we know this H gives you the gravitational wave pulse pressure, 
this P will give you a sort of a background, which is HX. So now P equal to 1 gives you the exact plane gravitation. And this is a non background solution in GR. <coughs> Why this is non background? Because this P is not equal to 1. And this is not as a flat. So now if you construct you equal to construct hardware surfaces, they will not be planar, but they will be curved due to the presence of matter or a cosmological constant. In this kind of space time, there will be matter or a cosmological constant. So what we did in our next work is to choose P in such a way that the background is a constant scalar curvature space. By what I mean, you choose P like that and your background is like this H2 times M1. What is H2? This hyperbolic space times M11. Why M11? This is because this. So if you remove this H, this M11 is this part, Minkowski 1 plus 1 dimension. And this H2 comes from here. Right? Hyperbolic two space. And you can choose P like this, Gauss hyperbolic way, you get a constant positive curve. But the background topology is like this to times. And you can say this H, say hyperbolic square root, x square minus y square. So we have chosen a different sort of positive value. Previously we chose square pulse, which is discontinuous, but the same hyperbolic square u is like this only, like Gaussian. So this also resembles a gravitational wave for scenario. Now here we study again memory effects by numerically solving the geodesic. So here we solve the geodesic equations for the negative curvatures in which square is constant and negative. And this is generated by a cosmological <coughs> constant. So here you find that the separation initially is constant but finally change along x. That is mean that means that there is no velocity. So earlier we had velocity but in this kind of space time for negative curvature we don't have velocity. Okay. That is a change when you when you go to another kind of radiative space time you have a change. What happens in case of positive curvature? You find that along x the separation increases along x and along y you find a new phenomenon. <coughs> which we call as the frequency level. So after the passage of the pulse, the geodesics try to occupy. And this is what we call as the frequency memory effect. So this is a new phenomenon that we have observed in our work. So cool waves are basically understood by this frequency memory. So this is the oscillatory motion in general. And you find that each geodesic has a particular frequency associated with it. So now, we showed for cosmological constant, but even if you consider a matter scenario, you find similar internal <coughs> memory effects. And this frequency memory that I talked about, the oscillatory generation, is seen for different choice of coordinates. So this led us to wonder whether there is a relationship between the memory effect and the background curve. So is it only GR dependent? What happens to other things? And this led us to our next work to branch the let me summarize here. So since we are getting different kind of memory effects for different positive and negative curvature solutions, this led us to wonder whether it is only GR dependent or other theories are also have this kind of thing. So this we examined in the simplest possible electricity field, that is a glass field trap. So I'll briefly go through this first part which discusses only glass field theory solutions in cool geometries. So this is the action that we considered. As you know, this is in Jordan's frame, and this is the field equation that we call. So we want the branch field vacuum. So let me set to zero. But not cool waves need matter, as I so showed earlier. But what happens, branch field has an additional degree of freedom, which is the scalar field. And the scalar field gives you the additional degree of freedom to have the matter source, to generate the matter source for two geometries. So this is the metric and Zach's discussion. And we solve the field equations for transfer gravity. And we end up with some solutions, which is given over here. And note again this h, this h tilde, this h tilde is a free function. It is not fixed. So this is again chosen as a pulse program. And we find a Ricci scalar like this, which has similarities. So omega equal to minus 2 is only a constant negative curvature solution. For omega not equal to minus, there is a singular. 
So we study memory effects now using geodesics and the deviation equation. So what happens? What is the change? So recall when we are studying general relativity, we used H like this, which has a constant, cosmological constant, but a non-zero matter, uh, a zero matter. But so this led us to constant curvature spacetimes by choosing different types of t factors, conformal factors. Even for non-zero t mu nu, we found similar kinds of curvature. But what happens in branch? This h, this part x square minus y square, is fixed from the field equation and is dependent on the scalar field. So this h is different from this x square minus y square. So once the metric is changed, that means the geodesic equation will be. That means the behavior of the geodesic. So that is what is happening. So in Brown's day, since the metric is getting changed, right? That is why the different kind of memory effects we see. So the scalar field gives an effective matter, as I told earlier. And hence only constant negative parameter solution will be. And this has an impact on the memory effect. So first the geodesic equation, I will not go through this because this will take up time. So, because I have to discuss other parts. So, basically, this is the metric solution, and you have to study the geodesics over here. So, okay, so this is for the omega equal to minus the negative curvature solution. So, you see, here it is constant <coughs> negative curvature, and this is the geodesic. So, now you choose a pulse profile like that, and you obtain an analytic solution, right? So initially, you had two geodesics. Which means x1 equal to x2 equal to 0. But finally, at u tending to plus infinity, you find x1 minus x2 equal to a1 minus a. That is the memory. So this is the right. So initially the separation is zero, but finally there is a chain. And the pulse is present around this zero, which is solved. So this again you obtain a permanent separation type of solution. Which is like constant shift displacement memory. So, this is much like GR but induced by the scalar field. But what happens in case of omega equal to plus? So, this is a change in scenario, but here you find that R is like this. It is positive, but it corresponds to a singularity at x equal to 0. But in our analysis, we don't consider this part, but the space time has an overall positive. So here you find no kinds of frequency. So this is a positive parameter solution. You don't find any frequency. This is because the metric function has changed. It's a drastic change. And that is why the nature of memory effect is changed. Okay. So first I talked about geodesics and now geodesic deviation. So why you need, need to study geodesic deviation? So this is a fundamental problem. Basically, in case of food waves, as you saw, there is a factor P and there is a factor H. So this H was giving the gravitational wave contribution as I go back. So this H was giving you the gravitational wave contribution and this P is giving you the background contribution, as if you can think so. But when you study the geodesic equation, when you study the geodesic equations, you think you get a total separation, which is coming from the background and which is coming from the wave. But geodesic equation is non linear, that is why you can't decompose. Right? But geodesic deviation equation is a linear, and you can decompose. So the decomposition is achieved. Right? So in case of food wave, this decomposition that we are talking about can be achieved. Not in the metric formalism, but what happens in the deviation equation is that achieve the material. The separation changes from one separation coming from background and another separation coming from the base. So this is basically the methodology. So what we do is if we are stating. So you first write out the deviation vector. The deviation vector is xi in coordinate basis. You go to a Fermi basis. And in Fermi basis, you write down the deviation equation, and then you Write this deviation in two parts, background and wave. This background and wave because the background part contains these Riemann tensors which are not dependent on H and H. The wave demand can be decomposed into wave part 
and this wave part contains the which are proportional to gravitational constant right so that this remark is which has this terms h and h right will come from the gravitational field so what you have to find the evolution equation one for the background when there is no gravitational wave pulse and one for the gravitational field and then you need to solve it and once you have solved it you go back to quadratic basis because these are in quadratic basis and then you add them and when you add them you get the total deviation and then you match with the geodesic analysis vector right so first you started with the deviation vector you obtain the solution psi mu v which is the background and psi mu w which is the base and then you add them. you see what is the change with geodesic right equation okay. whether the geodesic analysis match with the deviation analysis vector. So this is the results that we have found. So that along x, it is going increasing as we have showed earlier, and along y there is no change. So this is much like the geodesic analysis results, and these are all obtained analysis for the omega equal to minus two. For omega equal to plus one, we also obtain, but in this case we obtain numerical solutions, and this is also quite resembles the results that we obtain for geodesic. So that means that the geodesic analysis results gives you the total data. But what is memory effect? The memory effect is only the constitution of the gravitational. This is blue part, right? So there is memory effect in both along x and y. Here also. But note that the gravitational wave contribution is less than the background part. Yes. Okay. So in conclusion of this radiative space-time part, we can say that the memory effects. You can understand it. Are dependent on both the space-time geometry and the underlying, right? So both the space-time geometry change, memory effect changes, or the underlying theory from GR to Gauss group, the memory effect again changes. So this prediction is now examined for a certain kind of a different group, a warm, and memory effects when computed in smooth geometries are non-trivial since it has a curved background. So deviation analysis is more useful. Okay, so now memory effects in work. So this is a work that I did with one of the people sitting here, Shomukha Chaju, and another Shomukha Chaju from ICS. So what we do here is to use the Tanmo Soda effective theory of gravity. This is a brain work we had, where you have two four-dimensional brains embedded in a five-dimensional bulk. So what you do is that in this scenario, you try to write down the five-dimensional magnetic field equation, and then you project them to the four-dimensional brain, which has the work, and you expand it into the bulk brain scenario, and then you end up with this Tarnosuda effective field of gravity. So this is a four-dimensional metric line element like that. So what is special in this kind of hormones? Is that in this kind of hormones, this on brain matter satisfies the energy condition. So as you know, this a hormone, it decomposes, right? And for GR, what happens for this decomposition, we need to invoke exotic matter. So, hormones, for sustaining hormones, we need to have phantom physical hormones. But here, what happens is that there are two kinds of matter, right? If you write down the Einstein field equation, you have two kinds of matter. One is from the brain, and one is from the stellar field, which is called the radiant field, which comes from the bulb. So that's why, since this since this term violates the energy conditions, this term, uh, uh, I mean, the on-brain matter field need not violate the energy. That is why exotic matter fields on the brain do not. To violate the matter field, and that is why it is an interesting hormone choice. But it's still unphysical. Huh? It is still unphysical. So, I'm mean, not unphysical in the sense that you are in four dimension, you don't know what is happening in the higher dimension. Okay? The radion field is present in the higher dimension. So, in the four dimension, everything is goes in perfect. So, this TVU for radion, what you wrote on the board, yeah. I think that is spec. Specifically on the on the brain, right? That source term induced from the bulk to brain. 
So this is a four dimensional yes. Yeah. That is on projected on the brain. Yes. But it has an information of the bulb. Yes. That's why like on the brain the matter that you have, they do not satisfy the they satisfy the matter. Yes. But these are smiling. Yes. Ultimately they're smiling because one must have to be there. And this is the paper that I so this hormone solution comes from a paper from Chan Toshun Toshin Book and Chan Lai. Okay, so this is the hormone choice that we have taken. And after I have motivated it, so we go to a different kind of coordinate system, which is called the Bondi Sachs coordinate system, because it has certain advantages when I talk data. And in here, you can write the metric in this fashion, right? But this F R and G are metric functions, which are written in terms of this P. But this P is the ratio of the two hormone hairs, kappa by Okay. So now, how are we studying ability? We do it in two ways. One is the geodesic analysis, and another is the Bernoulli mass loss, evaluated at null input. So, in geodesic analysis, what we do is to study first the metric and then we introduce a TT gauge perturbation, transverse stress gauge perturbation over here, where this transverse stress gauge perturbation comes in these terms, HU and this minus HU. Then, where this stressless and also transverse, so we end up theta phi degree. So now what happens is that again, if you understand, if you go back to the first part of my talk, you start with two geodesics or two or more geodesics. You initially give the constant separation, but after the passage of the pulse, you see the separation changes, both along delta U and delta R. So this is the scenario that captures the memory. If there was no memory, that is without gravitational wave, the geodesics would have followed this blue track. But since there is a gravitational wave, Follows this red thread. So there is both displacement and velocity memory. I have showed only the displacement figures, but there is a velocity memory as you can see because if you differentiate the red parts, I mean, to take a different solution, you will not find them to be zero but have a finite value. Okay, so now what happens in null infinity? So the basic thing here is to understand that if you want to start with any radiation, the natural home to study any kind of radiation, be it electromagnetic, be it gravitational, we have to go to null infinity. Because once it reaches null infinity, then you can only tell that is the radiation. So now what happens is that for asymptotically flat space times at around null infinity, and if you want to change from one asymptotically flat space time to another asymptotically flat space time, the symmetry group is not the point directly that we know. The 10 dimensional Poincare group is not found. But one finds that this symmetry is going from one asymptotically flat space time to another asymptotically flat time, space time is that infinite dimensional symmetry group known as the bonding Wexner Sachs group, or in short form the BM. So this BMS group dictates what will be the asymptotically flat space time. So basically, what happens that when one changes from one asymptotically flat space time to another, you have an inject of soft gravitons. So this presence of soft gravitons are measured through this memory. So what this metric looks like here is that it is has the gravitation, it has the wormhole parts, along with some other parts, which is consistent with this bondy gauge or the bondy flex coordinate system at around null infinity. And they all capture the effect of the gravitation. And since I have expanded it in terms of 1 by r, this is because I am going to null infinity. Right? The field follows as 1 by r. So what is this term? This term is the important term, the term in GU square. So this mp comes due to the gravitational wave. If there was no gravitational wave, this mp would have been 0 and we had a constant bond. So suppose you write the partial metric, you expand it in 1 by r. So what, what is the bonding of? Is the mass the m term 1 minus p m by r? So this m term, but here you find a different type of mass term which is dependent on the wormhole here. So this is the total metric which has a wormhole part and the gravitational wave part, and this is written in a fashion which satisfies this bonding gauge. So bonding and sacks are the people who are working, they know certain gauge and which has some advantages. That is why we have written our metric in this fashion. 
for the sake of simplicity, we have assumed an accessible system. But you can also work with non accessible systems. So, so, what the methodology of understanding is that you first prescribe this tensorial or scalar mu. So, mu's function you have to specify. So, mu's function is one of the gravitational wave functions. And so, it encodes the information of the gravitational wave and which we take, take as the same hyperbolic square pulse. And then you study the gravitational field equation in the order of 1 by r. So, the gravitational field equation is the same at order of 1 by r. And what you find is that you can find a solution for this in by following the field equation, which is the bonding mass. So, had there been no radiation in space time, this bonding mass would have been constant. But since there is some radiation, you can see that the bonding mass is. So that is what is happening. But what is interesting is that, and this is the first paper that shows that, that this bonding mass depends on the wormhole here, that is E. So if you change from one wormhole to another wormhole, you have a change in the bonding mass. The bonding mass has the effect on the wormhole here apart from other effects of the gravitation. So both the geometry and the gravitational wave dictates the bonding mass law. Okay, so this work now can be generalized to other exotic compact objects. Give me a minute. And then I will solve the field equations and I will give you back the value. <coughs> For any astrophysical research problems. But you have to find out the grid. And this can be used as a paradigm to study the black hole universe, much like with the gravitational wave force of working on the modes. So I will end up here. Thank you. What can we say about black hole numericals? Just to invest in Okay, so black hole numericals are certain that are exotic objects which generally mimic the signals of black holes found in astrophysical objects. Right? So you have seen those gravitational wave chart signals, right? When two black holes emerge, and I mean, when two exotic compact objects emerge, they find that there is a black hole. So you can find out the polynomial mode state, or the equal state. I mean, in case of black holes, you don't have it. So you can find out the polynomial mode state. But that state can also be found from wormholes, also from gravity stars, also, right? Right? And this somehow, if you superpose them, you somehow see mm -hmm. that all of them match in the linear order, and you find out the linear form. So, if you study this memory effects, you can find that for different kinds of exotic compact objects, you will find different kinds of bonding mass loss. So, when there is a gravitational radiation, there will be a bonding mass loss of the system. So, for different kinds of gravitational wave compact objects, you can compute what is the bonding mass loss. Then you can tabulate it, I mean, you can use it as a template for understanding what is happening in the observation. So, given one observation, I can understand, you compute the bonding mass you can understand what is the nature of the compact for a black hole. So this memory effect can be detected in LIGO and LISA? Yeah, yeah, I didn't go through this because I was talking about mathematical aspect, but yeah. So what happens is that when you pass through a gravitational wave, it becomes memory. So the separation, proper distance between the two arms is But since it is very minuscule, and LIGO has some problems because it's a down to So it has it always goes back to the configuration. In order to observe memory, you need to have to truly, truly go in detail. Right? It's possible to do. And so the prospects of detection, gravitational moments are good for this rather than this. So when LISA comes up, that's when you start. I think uh, this. So all, I mean, as far I understand that gravity wave detectors, they are detecting the frequency, that how how much frequency is coming for the gravity wave. Let's say 150 hertz or something they have detected. So how this memory effect can directly have some impact on on the frequency? I mean, they are they, they can only show the deviation in the velocity, right? Maybe. No, no, I'm saying that the separation will change, right? The detector's length will change. 
got the memory you can set the yeah the so black hole mass just for binding and some other the hot so theoretically it is yeah it is what it comes in this effect is another modified for this data model so is there any more questions there are not let's thank the speaker once again